uh, good afternoon. Uh, my name is uh, Christopher Bider. I was the uh, last uh, UK judge at the Court of Justice uh, between 2012 and uh, 2020. And I'm delighted that I've been asked to host uh, the webinar uh, today. This is the second in the series put together by the Centre for European Legal Studies at Cambridge and uh, Moncton Chambers. And today's topic is interpretation, enforcement and dispute resolution. Um, and uh, looking at the stellar list of speakers that we have uh, uh, for you uh, this afternoon and the topics, uh, I would uh, simply say this by way of introduction, that uh, in the old days, which um, by the old days I mean when uh, the United Kingdom was a member of the European Union, uh, this was a relatively simple topic in the sense that uh, one had interpretation uh, and enforcement uh, in the UK courts uh, by individuals or by the uh, commission uh, direct actions in the Court of Justice. And if there is an issue of interpretation uh, or validity of, of an EU measure, there's a reference to the ECJ, which then pronounced on it and then the domestic court uh, uh, applied it. However, uh, the position is, to say the least, a little more complicated uh, now in the future. And to take us through what the future uh, may look like, I'm going to start uh, by introducing Professor Takis Tridemas, who is a uh, professor of EU law at King's College uh, uh, London. I've known Takis for many, many years. He's been uh, frequently here uh, at the court very well known in uh, academic uh, circles, and I can think of no one better than to kick us off with the, with the title Enforcement and Dispute Resolution under the Withdrawal Agreement. Over to you, Takis. Thank you very much. It's a, a great pleasure. It's an honor to have the uh, opportunity to participate. Uh, what I am going to do is give a bird's eye view of the enforcement mechanisms um, that are available under the Withdrawal Agreement. Um, as uh, uh, Judge Vida explained, this was an easy topic, but no longer. Um, so essentially, the dispute resolution mechanism under the withdrawal agreement is, like the withdrawal agreement itself, somewhat uh, distinct. It is a sui generis. Uh, and I think this is because it reflects an inherent tension between international law, on the one hand, and elements of European Union law, on the other hand, what I would call the residue of integration, which is necessarily present uh, in an agreement that seeks to end a, a, a very intense legal relationship. So um, the dispute resolution mechanism has, I would say, the following main uh, features. First, it is not unitary. It is characterized by the existence of multiple mechanisms uh, and multiple fora. Uh, and these are both judicial and non-judicial. So there are uh, two non-judicial fora to bear in mind. One is the Joint Committee, which is provided for by Article 164 of the Withdrawal Agreement. Uh, this is a committee which is made up of representatives of the United Kingdom and the uh, European Union and which provides the forum for consultation um, uh, between the two parties. Um, it has a particular role uh, in the event of a dispute because there is a best efforts clause in Article 169 of the Withdrawal Agreement. Uh, if the two parties have a dispute, they must use their best endeavors within the uh, Joint Committee to resolve it before going to arbitration. Um, the Joint Committee is not the only a, a non-judicial body which is relevant. There is also an independent monitoring authority uh, which in the United Kingdom, which is tasked with ensuring that the United Kingdom complies with a part two of the withdrawal agreement, uh, which provides for citizens' rights. Uh, and this is governed by Article 159 of the uh, agreement and um, uh, it, it has powers to conduct independent investigations. It also has powers to bring actions before a, a UK 
uh, courts. So um, let me then go to the uh, judicial uh, fora, to, to the ways of resolving the dispute, uh, any disputes between the parties uh, uh, judicially. Um, and these are essentially three. It's domestic courts, uh, it is the European Court of Justice, and it is also an arbitration panel. Uh, if one were to take them chronologically, then um, I would say the following, but I'm going to be very brief and then focus on a couple of issues, bearing in mind a uh, time limit. Um, now, during the transition uh, period, the institutions of the European Union um, continue to exercise powers and jurisdiction in relation to the United Kingdom. Uh, and this is, for example, why the Commission has initiated uh, proceedings against the United Kingdom in relation to the Internal Market Bill under Article 258 of the Treaty, which is the normal enforcement uh, procedure, where the Commission considers that the Member State has failed to comply with its obligations under the Treaty, then it can take a, a, a action before the European Court of Justice. This action has both an administrative and a judicial stage, uh, but it is essentially the classic enforcement action under uh, um, uh, the treaties. Now, um, this is during the uh, transition period. Uh, uh, now, going after the transition period, uh, Articles 86 and 87 of the agreement uh, provide uh, essentially for the continuing jurisdiction of the Court of Justice in relation to pending cases cases that have um, been initiated, uh, have commenced before the end of the transition period. Uh, and Article 87 also allows the Commission to bring actions after the end of the transition period if they relate to conduct of the UK, um, which the Commission considers is incompatible with EU law, but before the transition period. Uh, so these continue to be, as it were, a, a kind of transitional uh, provisions. So what about the continued jurisdiction of the um, a, a Court of Justice? Uh, in other words, jurisdiction in relation to disputes that arise after the end of the transitional period. And the, such disputes may go to the arbitration panel, to which I will come in a minute, um, but they may also go to the European Court of Justice. In particular, the, there are four areas where the Withdrawal Treaty recognizes jurisdiction to the ECJ. These are in relation to uh, uh, disputes pertaining to citizens' rights uh, governed by uh, Part 2 of the agreement. Uh, and this jurisdiction is conferred by Article 158. Secondly, jurisdiction uh, in relation to the financial settlement provisions of the uh, withdrawal agreement. This is governed by Article 160 of the Withdrawal uh, uh, Treaty. Um, thirdly, jurisdiction in relation to the um, Protocol on Northern Ireland. And finally, jurisdiction in relation to the Protocol on the Sovereign Basis of the United Kingdom uh, in Cyprus. Now, um, I don't have time to go through all through them. What I would say is this, the strongest of these four kinds of jurisdiction, to my mind, is the second one, i.e. jurisdiction of uh, uh, financial settlement provisions. And I say it is the strongest because there, a, a, a preliminary reference procedure continues to apply in full force. English courts, British courts may make a reference and also the commission may bring um, enforcement uh, proceedings. Uh, in relation to citizens' rights, uh, on the other hand, the European Court of Justice has a continued jurisdiction for eight years after the end of the transition period, so um, until 2028, uh, and in courts of the United Kingdom may make reference to the uh, ECJ uh, pertaining the interpretation of Part 2 on citizens' rights, um, it doesn't have an obligation to make a reference. There is a, the, the reference procedure, in other words, is not as strong as the procedure provided by Article 267. Uh, incidentally, uh, during the transition period, um, UK courts have made references to the European Court of Justice 
Uh, last time I counted, I made them seven, uh, seven references during the transition uh, period, but I may well uh, uh, be unaware of other references. Um, um, good. So they, uh, I now go to the uh, dispute settlement process, um, the arbitration panel. Uh, this is provided for in articles uh, 167 to 181 of the withdrawal uh, treaty. Uh, again, I don't have time to go through it in detail, but I would say the following. First, um, the arbitration panel um, is independent. The procedure is transparent. Um, the dispute resolution mechanism, I would say, is fairly strong. And it is fairly strong uh, in the following respects. I, I think there is a matrix of provisions which reduce the possibility of uh, stalemate in the appointment of arbitrators. Problems that arise currently, that have arisen recently and continue to exist in the context of the World Trade Organization um, by a, a contracting parties delaying the process of, of appointing judges um, are less likely to arise because there are safety mechanisms a, a, which make much easier a, a, um, the constitution of an arbitral uh, tribunal. Um, uh, secondly, it is a strong procedure because ultimately it provides for the for retaliation, the payment of a, a lump sum uh, or a penalty payment in the event that one of the parties does not comply with a, a decision of the arbitration tribunal. There are safeguards there, but ultimately a retaliation um, a, a retaliation action can be taken. Uh, this needs to be proportionate. Uh, retaliation does not include, a, a, um, at least to my mind, the denunciation of the whole agreement. There are limits, in other words, a, 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 as to what retaliation may um, provide. Um, the procedure is, is said to be exclusive. In other words, the parties, the EU and the UK, have to use it, but exclusivity operates without prejudice to the um, uh, other provisions of the agreement that may lead to the ECJ power. Um, I, I will highlight one more point of this um, uh, resolution mechanism, which is Article 174, uh, and which uh, provides that disputes before the arbitration panel that raise questions of union law uh, are not to be resolved by the panel, but uh, they have to be referred to the European Court of Justice. So this is a, a distinct arrangement. It is a novel arrangement. Um, the panel has to make a reference. References are compulsory to the ECJ where there is an issue of interpretation of, of uh, EU law. Um, the language of Article 174 is somewhat looser than the language of Article 267 of the treaty. Uh, it doesn't say, for example, that reference may only be made when it is necessary um, to resolve the dispute, but I think that can be uh, implied. Uh, the arbitration panel cannot have an obligation to make such a reference unless without the reference it would not be possible to, to resolve the case. Still, there are, I think, interpretational difficulties uh, in that. Um, now, when, um, uh, when is, it to, when is the, the arbitration uh, tribunal to make reference? Where there is a question concerning the interpretation of a provision of EU law, um, or among other cases, where a concept of European Union law is involved. And that is a much broader area I don't have time to go through this now, but um, maybe you can come back during the discussion. The final method of a settlement is through domestic courts. The agreement has, um, a, a, or a, at least in my view, the agreement has, has direct effect. Uh, I'm going to leave it here because I'm aware of time. In conclusion, a, a distinct, strong, a multifaceted system of enforcement which falls short of EU standards, but it is, it is very strong by reference to international law. Thank you very much.
thank you very much, uh, Takis, for that uh, magisterial uh, overview. And uh, I immediately would have a question for you if I was an, a member of the audience as to what really is EU law is the withdrawal, because you said it's, it's, it's more international law. And the question, I suppose, is to what extent is it a hybrid? But leave that uh, to one side for the moment. I now have great pleasure in uh, asking Dr. Laurent Bartels, who's at the University of Cambridge, a reader of international law at the Faculty of Law and a fellow of Trinity Hall, to, to some extent, uh, gaze into a crystal ball because he's going to tell us about enforcement and dispute resolution in the future relationship, Laurent. Uh, yes, thank you very much. So what I'm going to talk about is, uh, yes, uh, quite right, a little bit hypothetical because we don't know uh, whether there will be an FTA. Uh, so we also don't know, obviously, what dispute settlement will look in this FTA. Um, and we do know uh, that the topic of dispute settlement in any EU-UK FTA is a topic for negotiation. And so we have many uncertainties there. So what I can do is say a little bit about dispute settlement in FTAs uh, and in particular EU FTAs. But I want to begin very briefly uh, just by saying that even if we have an FTA with dispute settlement, the WTO is still there. And it's there because uh, most FTAs actually don't have exclusive jurisdiction. They have a forum selection clause. So you get to choose whether to go under the FTA or whether to go to the WTO. Um, and again, we don't know uh, what an EU-UK FTA will look like, but um, I would not be surprised at all if we had a clause like that. Of course, once you choose one forum, you've got to stick with it. And that makes sense because a lot of the obligations are the same, just like a lot of the obligations in the EU treaty, if the EU lawyers will forgive me, were plagiarised, uh, translated into French, and then for our purposes, retranslated back into English uh, from the original GATT, uh, the EU Treaty of Rome being 10 years after the gap. So it's the same thing, right, in many cases. There are, of course, lots of obligations in FTAs that you don't find in the WTO, but the core ones are there, like non-discrimination, um, uh, well, essentially non-discrimination, uh, and sometimes the FTAs even refer to WTO law, particularly in the area of technical standards and so on. So WTO is important. It's also important because if you do something in your FTA that violates WTO law, the other side can basically ignore the FTA and go to the WTO. And this has happened many times. Um, and uh, from the WTO point of view, they don't see FTAs as anything special. Um, they just see them as, uh, you know, arrangements between WTO members uh, into say, which, uh, you know, good for them if it works. And if it doesn't work, well, the WTO is always there as, dare I say, at a backstop. So we can't forget about that. Now, what about the FTA uh, system itself? Well, in fact, Tuckers has uh, set out a lot of what is um, common for dispute settlement in FTAs. So the most important points, uh, as opposed to EU law, for instance, are these. It is state to state only. Uh, individuals don't have um, the ability to bring proceedings. It is international law in that sense. Um, there is no direct effect. The EU used to give direct effect to its FTAs, but it stopped that practice quite a long time ago now. Uh, I mean, I would say almost 20 years ago. And, um, uh, and so there's no direct effect in modern EU FTAs either. So it's very traditional state-to-state -state, um, dispute settlement. Uh, what else can we say? Well, um, remedies. So remedies are quite different. Um, in, uh, there's a split actually in the practice between the US can, and Canadian FTAs on the one hand and everyone else's FTAs on the other. Um, so US and Canada actually have a system of fines, they call them monetary assessments. If they're not paid, um, then you get to retaliate, which means suspend your obligations under the agreement. The EU FTAs don't do it with fines. So if we have a standard, you know, skinny Canada style, which means Canada EU style, and on this point more EU uh, FTA, um, we can expect that there won't be any reference to fines and it will just be um, retaliation. So what is retaliation? Well, um, it's actually a little bit like Tuckers was explaining in the withdrawal agreement um, arbitration uh, rules. Basically, it doesn't include any concept of damage or damages rather for pre-existing injury. What happens is um, you, you have your tribunal, the complaining party, 
wins the case, the respondent losing party then has some time to implement, which means comply, can offer compensation, which is a settlement, just like in any case, uh, that's always possible. If that doesn't work, then the complaining party gets the right to suspend obligations, which must correspond to its damage. Um, so as a respondent party, there is actually an incentive not to comply immediately because you get all this extra time, all the time throughout the case until you lose. And even when you lose, you get a period of implementation time uh, to actually comply, which is a bit of a weakness um, in the system. Um, what else can I say? Maybe a word on applicable law. So um, uh, as uh, Tagi said, this is a bit of a, an issue, uh, you know, how much role would the ECJ have in interpreting any EU law referred to in an EU UK FTA? The EU likes to give the ECJ this role. It is analogous to a reference to a, uh, for a preliminary ruling. The, the uh, Tagi says reference to Article 267 is, I think, perfectly apt. Um, I should say there is some variation in how this is done in EU FTA practice. So you see, for instance, in some of the agreements, the, and in fact, in the withdrawal agreement, it refers to concepts of EU law, which could be a lot, right? Um, you know, principles here and there. In uh, the Ukraine Association Agreement, uh, which I think is a good model in many respects, uh, the reference is much stricter. It's to a provision of EU law incorporated into the agreement. Um, and that, of course, you know, takes away principles and, and so on. So it's much, much stricter. But again, we have no idea what it's going to look like, but these are the uh, parameters um, that I think we can expect to see. Um, I think that's probably the guts of it. Um, maybe one final point to mention is it's not just about dispute settlement. FTAs uh, and the WTO also have a variety of exceptions clauses, non-economic non exceptions clauses, in addition to um, economic exceptions clauses. So the non-economic ones every EU lawyer will be familiar with. It's essentially Article 36, which is taken from Article 20 of GATT, which is public policy, and then you also have security exceptions. So these are unilateral, subject to dispute settlement, of course. Um, but what you don't anymore find in EU law, at least not since the old Article 115 disappeared at the time of the single market, is safeguard clauses. And safeguard clauses are very common in FTAs and very common in particular in EU FTAs. And there's one in the withdrawal agreement in the Northern Ireland Protocol, Article 16, which has been a cause of some commentary recently. And essentially, this says that if the application of the obligations in the FTA lead to uh, an economic disturbance, but in EU FTA practice also social disturbance, which is something much more flexible, um, then you are entitled to take uh, appropriate measures which um, have to be proportionate and, and so on. Um, this is uh, you know, a sort of unilateral snapback mechanism. We know from news reports that uh, the Internal Market Bill has um, uh, let's say, inspired the uh, EU member states at the moment to um, insist on this sort of mechanism in addition to normal dispute settlement in any EU UK FTA. Let's see how that turns out. But that the concept of safeguard measures is certainly um, nothing new. So I think I'll, I'll just stop there. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Laurent, for that. Well, we're now going to um, turn our attention uh, to what's happening or what will happen uh, in the United Kingdom. And our next speaker, Dr. Emily Hancock, who is um, the Spencer Ferris Fellow of Law at Selwyn College, Cambridge, is going to talk to us about um, interpreting and departing from retained EU law and case law. Uh, Emily. Okay, so um, thank you. And I first wanted to say uh, thanks very much to uh, Jack and Kenneth for inviting me to speak as part of this excellent series of webinars. Um, so today I'm going to talk about interpreting and departing from retained case law. And I'm going to discuss three main points. So I'll start by introducing the concept of retained case law. Then I'll talk about how retained case law can be used by domestic courts going forwards and then in when and what circumstances it can be departed from. So firstly, starting with the idea of retained case law. So the EU Withdrawal Act 2018 aims to ensure legal continuity, and as the explanatory notes put it, a functioning statute book when the implementation period ends. 
And it does so by creating a new category of domestic law called retained EU law, which essentially takes a snapshot of the law in force on the 31st of December this year and ensures that this carries over. There are several exceptions um, to this, which I won't outline here and which were discussed by Alison Young in her presentation last week. But in essence, retained EU law covers existing domestic law, so that's Acts of Parliament as well as secondary legislation that implemented or otherwise um, gave effect to EU law in the UK. It also covers direct EU legislation, so mostly uh, regulations, as well as some other directly effective rights and obligations. But the problem with retained EU law for maintaining legal continuity is that retained EU law only copies and pastes the text of EU law. And, and not its interpretation. And if we want to ensure legal certainty and continuity, then it's necessary to carry over the interpretation of EU law. And this is particularly important on account of um, sometimes the, the vagueness of some provisions of EU law, on account of the more teleological modes of reasoning of the European Court of Justice, and also in light of the Mar leasing duty of consistent interpretation, which means that national law often needs to be read down or reinterpreted quite strongly in order to comply with EU rules. And it's here that um, Section 6 of the EU Withdrawal Act steps in. So according to Section 6 of the EU Withdrawal Act 2018, the meaning, validity and effect of retained EU law is to be interpreted in accordance with any retained case law, with the general principles of EU law, and having regard, among other things, to the limits of EU competence. Now then, retained case law does not only refer to the case law of the European Court of Justice. And it's here that Section 6 of the EU Withdrawal Act introduces a further subdivision. So retained case law refers to retained domestic case law, which is those principles laid down by and any decisions of a, court of, of a court or tribunal in the United Kingdom, which relate to retained EU law. But it also then retains EU case law, which is any principles laid down by and any decisions of the European Court of Justice, um, also in relation to retained EU law. And importantly, the, co the concept of retained case law only extends to those decisions of both domestic courts and the European Court of Justice up and until implementation day. So this means that when we're talking about continuity, we're not talking about keeping up with um, the case law of the European Court of Justice, Justice, but of maintaining continuity in terms of the law in force. So if I move now to discuss how retained case law can be used going forward. So there's quite a complex series of rules on the use of retained case law. And there's also a number of uncertainties in relation to interpretation. So when interpreting retained EU law, a domestic court or tribunal will have to ask several questions. So the first question they'll have to ask is whether or not that retained EU law has been modified in any way. So section eight of the EU Withdrawal Act includes the power to amend retained EU law so as to um, resolve any deficiencies with that law. So then if retained EU law has been modified, then a domestic court needs to ask whether it's still consistent with the intention of that modification to interpret the provision in accordance with retained case law. Now, this might be the case where the modification is fairly minor, such as deleting a reference to an EU body or to the other member states. So in the absence of any modification or whether interp or when interpretation is still uh, deemed consistent with that modification, a domestic court will then need to consider whether there is any domestic case law on the meaning of that particular provision of retained EU law. And this will be particularly important when it comes to the interpretation of EU-derived domestic legislation. And it's important to note here that when combined with the supremacy of retained EU law as preserved by section five of the Withdrawal Act, that the Mar leasing duty of consistent interpretation would still seem to apply. But if the matter has not come before domestic courts before, particularly or particularly if it relates to direct EU legislation or, um, or to directly affected provisions of EU law, then it's necessary to look at whether or not there is in fact a court of justice decision relating to this particular aspect of retained EU law. And if there is, then I'll come on to discussing when, whether or not it's appropriate to depart from this later. But if there is, we can assume that this would be followed for the time being. But if there is not, and this is perhaps where matters get a bit more complicated, um, 
It seems that by retaining the case law of the European Court of Justice, and this is also set out in the explanatory notes to the Withdrawal Act, that the um, intention is also to maintain the interpretative approach of the European Court of Justice in relation to retained EU law. And so, and the explanatory notes specifically state that they intend to maintain this um, more purposive mode of interpretation. So when it comes to the interpretation of direct EU legislation, domestic, the ECJ says that its approach is kind of, uh, describes this approach as being one which is literal, systematic, and teleological. And this means uh, for domestic courts, they might have to um, look to the recitals of the relevant EU legislation or interpret that legislation in light of the aims of the treaties or in light as well of the general principles of EU law, such as proportionality, equality, legal certainty, as well as um, potential, as well as um, human rights, which are also recognized as, as general principles. Perhaps um, more importantly, when it comes to the interpretation of retained rights or obligations, there is a question of the extent to which this concept of retained case law means that the more um, integrationist or communitaire aspects of court of justice uh, of the court of justice case law should also continue and that national courts should also try to emulate this so in particular when interpreting particularly treaty provisions the european court of justice looks to concerns such as the uniformity and effectiveness of eu law as well as the commitment to ever closer union and also certain goals such as the construction of um, the internal market as well as other kind of mainstreaming provisions which we find at the start of the treaties and it's unclear perhaps the extent to which um, all of these different interpretative or what have sometimes described as meta-teleological um, interpretative approaches of the European Court of Justice will be retained as part of um, as part of retained case law and this is in part because I suppose it's particularly alien to the reasoning style of British judges to kind of emulate the mode of reasoning of the European Court of Justice. But it's also that perhaps in some instances it might feel inappropriate to be interpreting retained EU law in light of these more communitaire aspects of the treaties. Um, and this is something that I'll, I'll discuss briefly when I come on to um, discussing when it's appropriate to depart from retained case law. But I first just wanted to mention something about what this means in relation to the EU Charter for, for Fundamental Rights, which is explicitly not part of retained EU law. However, the Charter will be kind of indirectly maintained because where there is an interpretation of retained EU law in light of the Charter um, of, both domestic, of both domestic legislation which implements EU law, but also of direct EU legislation, then this interpretation will be maintained, but the Charter may also be maintained indirectly via the general principles of EU law. Although the European Court of Justice has not recognised that all Charter rights are also general principles, although we might infer this from the codificatory nature of the Charter. So moving on to when it's permissible for domestic courts to depart from retained case law. So differing rules apply here, depending upon whether we're dealing with retained domestic case law or retained EU case law. So retained domestic case law has the same precedential status that it normally has. So it won't be, so a, a decision on the interpretation of EU law or of retained EU law by a lower court won't be binding upon a higher domestic court. Whereas retained EU case law essentially has the same status of Supreme Court decisions. So it can only be departed from the Supreme Court or the High Court of, Justici of, of Justiciary in Scotland, according to the tests which they have for departing from their own case law. And it's interesting to think about departure, um, sorry, uh, in relation to, um, I'm gonna finish very soon, in relation to um, new decisions of the, of the Court of Justice, because while all courts can take these into account, only the Supreme Court or the High Court of Judiciary can actually depart from uh, retained case law at the moment. So should the Court of Justice actually reverse its earlier case law, um, only actually the Supreme Court or the High Court of Just Justiciary could take this into account. Now, there has been a consultation on the possibility of departure and the results of that or the government hasn't yet res 
released its response. And so I won't say that much about that because I'm very conscious of time. So I'll, I'll hand back now, but thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Emily, uh, for that. Well, I'm sure that will, uh, will already has generated a number of questions and comments. And I now move to our uh, last speaker, uh, Jack Williams, who's a barrister at uh, Moncton Chambers. And if I may interject a personal note here, he was my first uh, stagiaire um, when I became a judge uh, here in Luxembourg in, in 2012. And it's no surprise to me that his career has uh, taken off uh, in uh, the United Kingdom. He is one of the counsel in the first Miller case, and he is going to talk to us about domestic enforcement and dispute resolution. Thank you, Christopher. That's very kind of you. So you remember from the last week that I said there were four different components of EU relations law. In this talk, I'm going to look at the top two components. Disputes arising in relation to the domestic level about retained EU law and the separation law stemming from the withdrawal agreement and the Northern Ireland Protocol. Turning then to the retained EU law, how is this enforced and litigated in domestic law? What sorts of disputes are we likely to see here? The first area of contestability that I can see arising is whether something is indeed retained EU law under the EU Withdrawal Act 2018 in the first place i.e. whether somebody can actually rely on it in UK courts. Professor Young explained last week how old EU law is retained in the UK law, but the interpretation of the 2018 Act itself is likely to be contested. For example, what about unimplemented or improperly implemented directives? Can they be di directly relied upon? Well, that depends on the meaning of the of a kind wording in the 2018 Act itself in section 4.2b. Does it mean that directives of the conceptual sort that would have been recognised by the ECJEU to meet the direct effect test? Or does it instead mean only those directives of a kind that have actually already been recognised by the court in a pre-existing case? I've blogged about this uh, quite extensively and you can see my views on that link, but the explanatory notes are contradictory on that point. Another example that Emily has raised is about the EU Charter of Fundamental Rights. That's not retained in domestic law, as the Act says that expressly. But the Act in Section 5 also states that that does not affect the retention of any fundamental rights or principles which exist irrespective of the Charter. So my bet is that we're going to end up with quite a few cases contesting the interaction of retained EU case law, as dis discussed by Emily, and the Charter. Was the retained EU case decided upon the basis of the Charter alone, or was it instead really implementing a general principle or relying on a treaty article or legislative provision interpreted in a particular way, which must then still be followed? Secondly, once you've established that an EU retained law right is in play and can be relied upon in the domestic courts, we still have to remember that there are differences from what we're used to. First of all, the Act states that the law is supreme, but only generally vis-a-vis pre-implementation period completion day, IPC day, legislation. So that means later domestic legislation can override the retained EU law. Secondly, there's no right or action in domestic law after IP completion date based on a failure to comply with general principles. So we know that that case law is not a cause of action in itself. But again, I think there are likely to be some creative disputes which are likely to arise here. You may not be able to use the general principle itself to disapply or quash any enactment or rule, but you can use it to interpret the rule. So you can't have it as your ground of challenge per se in your judicial review, but how far, I wonder, can the interpretation be used to the same uh, outcome and effect for claimant clients? I think there are ways and means that people will try and argue about. Thirdly, there is generally also now no right in domestic law on or after the end of the transition period to damages in accordance with the rule in Frankovich, i.e. state liability and compensation for breaches of EU law. Now that exclusion to the right of Frankovich damages in Schedule 1 of the Act applies both prospectively and retrospectively. So that means it includes Frankovich rights that claimants have as of now. That's the effect of paragraph 39 in Schedule 8 so some seven schedules later 
which really does demonstrate the point that you really have to have your wits about you when reading this particular act. Now, I say generally there's no right of Frankovich damages, as there are some exceptions. The main one for litigators on this webinar to be aware of is that claimants have two years from the end of the transition period to bring any Frankovich claims that relate to anything which occurred before the end of the transition period. Now, that sounds generous and is explained in the explanatory notes as generous. But what that actually does is reduce the current six year limitation period for breach of statutory duty for bringing the claim for two years. Now, the third level of disputes in relation to retention law is the big one, challenging the domestic regulations which amend retained EU law under the Henry VIII clause or the Charles I powers in Section 8 of the 2018 Act, which allows ministers to change and alter the meaning of retained EU law. Now, Section 8 is drafted very widely, meaning that regulations on their face can, can do and make any sorts of changes whatsoever, but it still has its limits. The power can, of course, only be used for two years, and there are express actions prohibited that can't be done by this domestic secondary legislation, such as introducing taxes. But the limits are broader than that and are likely to give rise to a substantial amount of domestic litigation. As this is secondary legislation, it could be challenged on all the normal grounds of judicial review. Moreover, these powers are usually interpreted very narrowly by the domestic courts. See the Supreme Court in 2016 in the public law project case. Now that means there are likely to be a number of virus issues raised by litigants. Firstly, is the amendment actually correcting a deficiency that's listed in sketch section eight? The list is long, but I think it's important to remember that the white paper introducing the bill stated, and I quote here, that it's not a vehicle for policy changes. Taking back control does not require us to change everything overnight, and we will not do so. Now, I suspect there will be a number of cases alleging at least that substantive and policy changes, rather than mere deficiencies, are being made by ministers on exit day. So it's not just a case of changing references to the Commission and the, and the UK to the CMA, uh, for example. I suspect a number of substantive changes are being made and are susceptible to challenge. And secondly, even if there is prima facie a deficiency, it has to arise out of Brexit. Just because Brexit gives the opportunity for some changes, that doesn't necessarily mean that the deficiency itself arises from Brexit. Now, I think this language has potentially been overlooked in some of the commentary on potential challenges to these regulations, but it'll be interesting to see how the courts uh, define and interpret the use of the language arising from, either narrowly or broadly. So that's some of the domestic litigation vis-a-vis -vis retained EU law. Now, what about the second level of the EU relations law, the provisions of the withdrawal agreement and the Northern Ireland Protocol? Article four of the withdrawal agreement, as Takis has alluded to, states that its provisions and the provisions of union law that it makes applicable shall produce effects in and of, in respect of the United Kingdom and produce the same legal effects as they would have produced within the union and its member states. It states accordingly, persons shall in particular be able to rely directly on the provisions contained or referred to in this agreement that meet the usual conditions for direct effect under union law. And it also states the UK, UK shall ensure compliance with that, including giving courts the required powers to disapply inconsistent or incompatible domestic provisions. So to borrow the metaphor from the Miller Supreme Court case, there then has to be a number of conduit pipes in domestic law, in domestic legislation, that brings in the withdrawal agreement law. It's not enough that there's just that, that stated in Article 4 of the withdrawal agreement itself because of the dualist status of UK law. Now, there are, in fact, a number of different conduit pipes in domestic legislation, and I've listed them there for the separate areas of substantive rules and how they flow into domestic law. The main one, though, is Section 7A of the 2018 Act, which was inserted by the EU Withdrawal Agreement Act 2020. It reads that all such rights, powers, liabilities, obligations and restrictions from time to time arising or created by the withdrawal agreement are without further enactment to be given legal effect or used in the UK. 
Now you'll remember that that's very similar and very closely related to the wording in section 2.1 of the European Communities Act 1972. This is in, its, in, in essence its replacement. And section 7c of the 2018 Act makes clear that domestic law implementing the withdrawal agreement, which is known as relevant separation agreement law, must be interpreted consistently with the withdrawal agreement provisions. So that's how the withdrawal agreements will end up in domestic law. And lastly, as Takis has alluded to, it's a little bit of a case of hello darkness, my old friend, because preliminary references are still a feature in at least the three areas that I've outlined on the slide. So there is still a role for the Court of Justice in Luxembourg post transition. I think it's worthy very briefly just to make uh, note of two things. Firstly, that the provisions of the withdrawal agreement, so part two, the citizens' rights, are, uh, give ECJ, the ECJ jurisdiction for up to eight years, whereas the Northern Ireland Protocol ones seem to give the ECJ jurisdiction forevermore. And secondly, in relation to the last Court of Appeals to so the Supreme Court vis-a-vis -vis the withdrawal agreement provisions, it's only a May uh, obligation to give a reference, whereas in relation to the Northern Ireland Protocol, because it brings in Article 267 of the TFEU, it's a must uh, refer to the ECJ obligation. So there are interesting quirks at, at the domestic level for how this will all work going forward. And with that, I hand back to Christopher, um, who I believe will um, introduce some of the Q&A session. Well, thank you very much, uh, <coughs> Jack, and thank you to uh, all our uh, speakers. And uh, we now uh, move to uh, seek to answer the comment on some of the questions that you, uh, the audience, uh, have put. Jack, do you want to kick off um, with um, some of the questions that have been submitted? Yes. So there is one I believe addressed to Takis. Uh, is there any theory by which a private party can take a direct action under the withdrawal agreement against a breaching party or in due course the FTA if, if it includes a strong enforcement mechanism? Or is this essentially a diplomatic matter? Takis, you're, you're muted at present. Uh, I'm so sorry. Th thank you. Yes, thank you, uh, Jack. Um, okay, I then, I, it, it depends what, what is meant by direct action. Um, I would say the following. I think the a withdrawal agreement is intended to produce direct effect. This appears from Article 4, Paragraph 1 of the agreement. Uh, that doesn't mean that the whole of the agreement has direct effect. It means that if a provision of the agreement um, meets the conditions of direct effect, in other words, it imposes a clear, precise, and unconditional obligation, then a, a party may uh, invoke uh, that provision before um, the domestic courts of an EU member state. Uh, a party may also invoke that provision before um, a, a court of the United Kingdom, and this results from two provisions. Article 4, paragraph um, 2 of the uh, agreement, which specifically imposes this obligation, and as a matter of domestic law, as you outlined uh, so well, from Article 7a of the Withdrawal Act 2018. So Article 7a, uh, in particular Article 7a1 and 7a3, um, es essentially replicate this idea of direct effect which was present under the European Communities Act as, as uh, you explained so well. Um, if by direct action in the question is meant whether an individual can uh, go directly before the European Court of Justice, then that would depend uh, on the admissibility requirements uh, provided therein being met. Um, so that avenue is, is more difficult, uh, but essentially th the agreement envisages, um, at, at least to my mind, as I said uh, earlier, en envisages the possibility of direct enforcement by, by individuals either before the courts of the United Kingdom or the courts of an EU member state. Thank you, Takis. There's one for Lorand, I believe, or a couple for Lorand on uh, WTO law. So the first is from Kenneth Armstrong. Any useful lessons that we can learn from actual disputes under EU FTAs 
Are there any standout uh, disputes to tell us how likely a state will use the FDA dispute mechanisms rather than the WTA mechanisms? Yep, sure. Well, there are hundreds of FTAs and uh, a good number of those have dispute settlement uh, provisions in them of the sort that I was describing with enforcement and so on. There are in um, the last few years, 20 years even, uh, four um, disputes under FTAs. There are many disputes between FTA partners that have gone to the WTO. Uh, why? Well, the simple answer is um, that the disputes that have gone to FTA dispute settlement involve, in, except in one case, obligations that don't exist in the WTO. So labor standards obligations, environmental standards obligations that you don't have in the WTO. So there's no choice. Um, there is one at the moment, which is EU against Ukraine involving export restrictions on timber, which could have gone to the WTO. Um, and I'm not quite sure why it didn't. Um, maybe there's a political dimension. Uh, what other lessons can we draw? Well, um, the, uh, uh, the best explanation for why, there are a couple of explanations for why countries prefer the WTO. One is um, it's got a good secretariat. Uh, so you know what you're getting in terms of support. Uh, that makes a big difference. The quality control is good. The other is that um, uh, you have the uh, transparency and the publicity and sunlight being the best in disinfectant um, dimension to WTO disputes, much more public than in a bilateral. And there are a few other explanations as well, but uh, essentially uh, the WTO is still a uh, king. Now, with the possibility of appealing into the void uh, with no appellate body, so WTO dispute settlement effectively becomes voluntary, um, it is likely that we'll end up with more FTA disputes, I think, between countries that um, don't want to play the WTO game. Uh, and, and I think there's a follow-up one for you as well, uh, Laurent. Are there material differences between dispute resolution provisions in the GATT 1947 and the GATT 1994, which is not reflected in the EU treaties? Well, I'll just take that as WTO disputes, I think, because GATT 1947 disputes haven't been relevant um, well, since the WTO, really, since it became compulsory, um, except for the shenanigans that uh, we are seeing at the moment. Um, the short answer is no, it's basically the same. Okay. And then, Emily, I think there are, there are two directed at you, but obviously Christopher and Takis can, can jump in. Uh, you mentioned the Mar Leasing principle, Emily. Should we regard that principle as itself part of retained EU law or simply part of retained case law, and does the distinction matter? Uh, then the other one, which I'll just address uh, at the same time, which is slightly different, but have, has the government given any indication as the result of the consultation on the regulations for its ability of lower courts to depart from retained uh, case law? And if not, what do you think the result may be? Um, well, if I start with the last question, which is that, um... I, I'm, I'm not privy to, to any insider information at all, so I don't know. Um, I also would not want to hazard a guess as to what the outcome would be, although I would say that overwhelmingly the responses to the consultation that I've read have suggested that the danger to kind of legal certainty and the potential for kind of forum shopping um, mean that most of the responses have suggested that the, the power should in fact not be used and the possibility of amending retained um, or departing from retained case law should be reserved to the Supreme Court and to the, the High Court of the Judiciary. In relation to the Mar leasing principle, so I mentioned it mostly in the sense that where an interpretation of retained domestic law has been interpreted in light of directives, kind of in light of the Mar leasing principle, that this will remain. Um, and I suppose the Mar leasing obligation or of consistent interpretation will remain in light of Section 5.2 of the EU Withdrawal Act and the um, explanatory notes to the Withdrawal Act, in fact, say this. Um, I don't think that means that it's um, retained case law or retained EU law. Um, perhaps it forms part of the kind of more general um, interpretative requirements. I think depending upon how we understand the definition of retained case law, the Mali Singh principle, might be maintained as retained case law. Um, but this is also made a bit more problematic by the fact that 
directives themselves unless they are kind of of a sort which might be um, retained won't necessarily form part of retained EU law which kind of complement complicates the interpretative um, approach which is required there so um, I'm not sure I really answered the question but <laughs> no 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 that, I think it's a really difficult one because it, it demonstrates that the different conduit pipes that you have between sections two and section four of the 2018 Act a number of principles could actually in theory come down a number of them i.e retained EU case law retained uh, EU law and so I think there's go there, there are going to be difficult um, disputes particularly in relation to mile eating. Now there's a there's an interesting question which um, I, I will include Christopher in as well from Marcus Guerin. Given the complicated legal question would you recommend that law students still study EU law for years to come? I wonder if anyone had any uh, views on that. Shall I kick off on that? Yes, uh, yeah. I can hear. Uh, in my view, uh, the answer uh, is yes, quite where it should go in the course it, it, it is a different matter, but one has seen that um, uh, EU law, uh, simply looking at the way that the uh, withdrawal agreement uh, uh, is structured, uh, will continue to play a, a great part uh, because the courts will be bound to um, apply EU law in, in certain circumstances. And the way that I see it, although it's early days yet, is that more generally um, uh, EU law will still be a source of law for, for English law in many in, in ways that, for example, the um, uh, Strasbourg court is a source of law. I mean, there's, there's no obligation uh, on an English court to follow uh, Strasbourg. And then one is also uh, to bear in mind that unlike the position, say, in 1972, which probably none of us can remember, uh, UK law is uh, very similar, or it's identical at the moment to EU law. And if we take just two examples, competition and public procurement, um, I very much doubt, I mean, that UK will have a, and in fact it can't, if it's complying with WTO, to have no public procurement and I would be very surprised if its competition law departed substantively from EU law and as somebody who sat on a large number of public procurement cases here in in Luxembourg uh, I can see that one constantly has new cases coming up and I would have thought those are going to be valuable guidance to to, to English lawyers and uh, I would also suggest uh, English law students so I think the answer is yes uh, EU law should continue to be taught um, at universities. Uh, and, and following up from that, Christopher, I know that you wrote a very interesting uh, blog post on the EU relations law blog in relation to that exact question of the importance of EU law going forwards. But also because Takis and I have both mentioned preliminary references, uh, I note and remember that you you said something about the court moving towards a more abstract response to preliminary references. Um, I don't know whether you're able to, to comment on the, the ECJ's new approach going forward. Yes, I mean, but, but yes, that is, uh, I mean, this is, this is a um, point which is, which is totally unrelated to, 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 to Brexit, is that uh, the preliminary reference uh, ruling uh, system has been, if I can put it this way, a victim of its own success because uh, uh, the court in Luxembourg has been overwhelmed with preliminary references. I should say that in my view, the UK always adopted, the UK judiciary always adopted a very sensible approach because the number of references from the UK uh, was, was always quite limited. And so in order to stop or rather reduce the incentive for references, the ECJ is seeking to move to, in some cases, to give a more abstract answer because the problem with giving a, an answer which is then very much centered on the facts of the case is that it is extremely tempting for a judge anywhere uh, within the EU to then send a follow-up question saying well in this case the facts are slightly different and particularly in, in for instance employment cases uh, there's been a, a, a growing tendency of that happening and so the move to if you like give a more abstract ruling is designed to, in a sense, say to national courts, well, really, we're just giving you the basics, you then, you then apply it. 
Um, there are still a number of questions, um, but I, I'm conscious that we've we probably hit the, the time limit, but I think we'll try and answer them in future uh, sessions. Most of them seem to relate to topics that we can we can cover in future webinars. So, um, Christopher. Well, it gives me a great pleasure to uh, thank uh, uh, all the speakers uh, for putting on a, uh, a wonderfully uh, rich diet, if I may put this, because we this is over lunch. I don't know, some of you may have been munching something while looking at the screen, but uh, even if you've been having that form of sustenance, I think you've got an awful lot of intellectual sustenance uh, uh, at lunchtime today. And I would... Uh, uh, urge those of you uh, who've been uh, in attendance to look out for the next uh, um, session uh, next uh, which is going to take place I gather on the 25th of uh, November and I'm sure it'll be as good as this one. Thank you all very much for attending and also for having uh, posted your very interesting questions. <laughs>